for the interest of time, I think I'll talk to this microphone. <laughs> so it's my great pleasure and also honor to be in this um, very, you know, well-established uh, conference. And I'm happy to introduce not the another person but quantum computer. And uh, uh, my title today is Software Development for Quantum Computers Application in Financial and Chemical Engineering Sectors. And my talk will, con be, will, be, will consist of the three parts. First, I'm going to introduce the basics of quantum computing. Then, then I will introduce our software development in the financial and chemical engineering sectors, as well as in the field of AI. And then, if time allows, I will talk about the results by Google so that you will understand the relation between Google and IBM's work. And they are very, very, basically very complementary. So um, I'm looking forward to speaking about all that. So I start from Moore's Law, and this contains the introduction of my sort of background. So basically, um, 1995, I received my PhD in material science, but also I was involved in the dark matter search. So I was in the physics field, I was building detector uh, in the Center for Particle Astrophysics at UC Berkeley. And, you know, basically the detector I built is still looking for dark matter. It's been 30 years. I haven't heard back from my detector, so I, 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 I hope he or she's doing well. But, um, but then I joined Keio University as a starting faculty position in 1995. And this is where I had, I put question mark, question mark here, because for two years I start, I, I look around to, you know, identify research topic that I should be working on. I didn't want to work on something that I can do, but I wanted to work on something, some, something someone should be working, and it's worthwhile to, to attack for the next 20 years. And when I look at this Moore's Law plot, I realized that by 2030, in 20 years from now, a bit will be the size of the single atom. So back then, it was 1995, so it was you know, 20, 35 years away. But I realized that you know, this might be an interesting topic to work at for the you know, next 35 years, right? processing information using single atom. And by definition, that is a quantum computer. So for a while, I looked around about the way to do this. And then this paper, uh, by now known as a very classic paper by uh, a person named Bruce Kane, came up. This was uh, 1998. This is the year that the Google was established. and he proposed to perform calculation using single phosphorus atom embedded in the substrate of silicon semiconductor. So this was my starting point. Bruce, this author, uh, spent a year in, in, a, in, a, in a University of New South Wales in Australia. He was there as a postdoc. And then he somehow came up with this idea. Bruce and I knew each other from UC Berkeley time, so I was very much impressed by his idea, and I immediately started to think about, you know, quantum computation uh, using single atom or single at single electron in silicon. And I spent next four years after Bruce's, um, you know, announcement on learning quantum computing and also coming up with my own idea which I succeeded in 2002, which I show in the right side panel. And this was a proposal paper I published, uh, we published in Physical Review Letter in 2002. And that marked the beginning of my experimental work on quantum computing, uh, compu computation, exper experimental work towards realization of silicon quantum computer. I composed this, the world of experimental quantum computation 2002, 18 years ago, uh, to basically show different proposals, different ways of building quantum computing, com computers. And the situation hasn't changed much. 
and 18 years, as, 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 lo as, you know, as, as long and the level, uh, as far as the level of what might be useful. Already I listed superconducting qubits, which are shown on the right-hand side, right? And also I listed spins and semiconductors and so on. But only a few survived so far to make the, you know, make basically survive up, up to until now. In the case of silicon quantum computing, we started from theoretical work in 2002 all the way to 2011 for uh, proof of concept experimental work we published in Nature 2011. Uh, this was also an, um, basically covered by New York Times. So this was actually quite well-known work. And then in 2015, in collaboration with uh, University of New South Wales in Australia, we succeeded in building two qubit quantum computer using conventional silicon uh, IC technologies. So, you know, we made real quantum computer, working quantum computer, um, using two electrons as qubits. And based on our work and also many other development, Intel in 2016, four years ago, announced the uh, you know, development of um, coming into the field of silicon quantum computer. And the following year, our team, team consisting of a researcher from New South Wales, University College London, Keio University, and Simon Fraser University in Canada, we all got together at Intel in Oregon, and we celebrated our you know, successful fabrication of two, 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 two qubit computer. And then we kind of decided to move apart because after two qubits, it's going to be industry's job to integrate further. And we, I switched uh, uh, my interest to development of software and also algorithm for quantum computers because, you know, what is the use of quantum computer without softwares, without algorithm that are useful? And, you know, this, this is a big problem, of course, you know, still today. We have to come up with something useful, something meaningful for academic as well as for industry so that, you know, we, we provide meaning to the development of quantum computers. So this is something that I became very much interested in in 2017. And, and this, that's the main reason that I decided to join the quant, uh, IBM Q network. And we established Hub at Keio University, which I will talk about later. So now I move on to basic introduction of quantum computer. So quantum bit is different from classical bit. Classical bit, as I show here, uses state zero or one. There's nothing in between. Quantum computer, based on qubits, also two use two digit, zero and one. But it, allow, it, it allows for superposition of zero and one. So one bit can hold both zero and one at the same time. I'll give you an idea. So here, I show zero at the lower state and one at the higher energy states. Think about compass. Compass pointing at north is lower energy state than compass uh, pointing south. So that's the energy difference between pointing at south, uh, north, and pointing at south. Point, you know, to turn the compass from north to south, it takes energy. That's the exact energy that, that requires to turn from zero to one. And interestingly, in the case of qubit, if you apply the exact energy you need to turn from zero to one, let's see what happened. Here I show on the right-hand side, time, as a function of time, we shine energy that needed to turn from zero to one and how qubit behaves. Qubit starting from zero, turn, um, 
as I keep shining energy, go up to one, and it doesn't stop there. It comes back to zero again, and it goes back to one again, and so on. It oscillates between zero and one as long as you keep shining this energy, keep providing this energy. This is called Rabi oscillation. This is a phenomena very unique to quantum, and this was given Nobel Prize in physics. So to turn, to turn from zero to one, it's a not gate operation. You, sh you shine energy, you provide energy, exact time from zero to T1 prime shown here. So you have to tune the energy, but at the same time, to tune the time so you, sh you turn exactly zero to one, okay? But you can also shine energy for the half of time to turn from zero to one so that you put the spin, or you put the qubit sideways. And this side wave state is known as the superposition states of zero and one. 50% zero and 50% one. Then what happens if it's only quarter? This is 75% one, sorry, 75% zero and 25% one. So you can just turn, turn the you know, weight, percentage of the zero and one continuously between zero and one by um, tuning the time you, exp you, you provide energy. Now I'm going to put another second qubit, but now the phase is shifted. So now I have the red qubit as well as red, uh, so a red qubit number two as well as blue original qubit number one. And if I shine energy for T1 till to blue qubit and T1 prime to red qubit, what happened? Blue qubit is turned sideways as well as red qubit is turned sideways. They're both sideways, okay? But it's not static. I'm going to show you in the next slide when blue and red are turned sideways, they don't stay, but they rotate, okay? The rotation axis is very often defined by externally applied magnetic field. So they rotate, and here, as you can see, the blue is ahead of red. The rotation speed is the same. It's a pre called precession, but red, blue is always ahead of red. And this difference in what we call phase is also important quantum information. So it's, it's not only zero and one, but also we have, to, we have to control another parameter called phase. Let's say, okay, this is what we call and coordinate at rest, but we're not, we're, I'm not going to turn this into so-called rotational frame. Let's for you, Matt, okay, we are on, on Earth, and I think this, this direction is east. We are all rotating on Earth together. And I'm, I'm here, and Bob is there. Bob is ahead of me because Earth is turning this way. But we don't see each other moving um, because we are moving in the same speed, and we are observing each other from where I am, and Bob is observing from where he is. So he's rotating, but he's rotating from the static point of view. I'm not rotating. So this is you know, how we view in the rotational frame. So from at the tip of this blue qubit, blue two qubit, from, the, from, from this tip of blue qubit, red looks static, but it's, red is just behind. And if you do this in this rotational frame, all of a sudden, the blue point becomes here, and red point becomes there. And then they are static. They're not moving because it's in rotational framework. This is called Bloch sphere. And any point on the sphere is the so-called pure state 
pure quantum state, uh, quantum information point. So basically what I'm trying to say here is that quantum information takes continuous values between 0 and 1 and continuous value between phase 0 to 300, 360 degrees. It's all continuous. It's not digital here. And we have to control such information. By the way, we have to cool down the quantum computer because the energy separation between 0 and 1 is very small. So we have to make the thermal energy smaller than the energy requires to turn 0 to 1. Okay? This is why quantum computer is cooled down nearly to 0 Kelvin. So once we accept such blob sphere picture, we can actually write down quantum information as a function of amplitude as well as phase. That's all you need to know, OK? This is the last equation I'm going to show. I just wanted to show you that quantum information, not about 0 and 1 only, but also we have to control phase. Now I can talk about super parallelism. With one bit, I can have both 0 and 1. With two bits, I can have 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1 at the same time. Four possibilities. With three bits shown here, I can have 0, 0, 0 all the way to 1, 1, 1. So I can have eight different combinations of numbers at the same time. OK? And for four bits, I can have 0, 0, 0, 0, 4, 0 to 1, 1, 1, 1, four ones. And that will be 2 to the 4, which is 16 combinations, 16 numbers. And if I have 280 qubits, that will be 2 to the 80 numbers carrying at the same time. That will be 10 to the 83. That's about equi equivalent to the number of atoms in the universe. So you can see quantum information, quantum computer can in parallel process so many numbers at the same time. That's really the power of quantum computer. Okay. I will show you the power using prime number factoring later. So what do we do using such qubits in quantum computing? Okay. In quantum computing, first we need to initialize all quantum bits. So set all qubits at zero. Then we need to operate, we need to perform operations. We need to run software um, depending on the, uh, according to the algorithm. Uh, there are many kinds of operation. One is rotation, rotating one, one qubit from zero to one. But also there is such operation as changing the phase from zero phase to two pi and so on. Something that, that doesn't exist in a classical computing. There's another kind of uh, operation that is called two qubit gate. So depending on the condition uh, state of one qubit, we do or we do not do anything to the other qubit. So in this case, we use uh, interaction between two qubits, just like exclusive or operation in the classical computing. Okay? And those kind of combinations are sufficient to perform any uh, quantum algorithm exists today. So combination of a single qubit and two qubit operations are so-called universal gates. And then at the end, we read out each qubit or qubits needed to be read out. And in this case, we just read out 0 or 1 from each qubit. So here I show six qubit uh, example. We only need to order what to do to six qubits. And at the end, I only need to read out, let's say if I need to read out six qubits, I only get strings of number 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 six zeros, and six ones. Only one combination. So using quantum computer remotely or via cloud is very easy. Information I, need, I send through 
cloud is very small. And then suddenly, the information becomes huge within quantum computer, due to, you know, thanks to this quantum parallelism. But at, at the end, when we read out, we only get strings of just six, zero, or ones for this kind of quantum computing. Okay? And what is the figure of MERS? Of course, we need you know, as many as large number of qubits as, as, we, as, we, uh, uh, as possible. But at the same time, quantum information is very vulnerable. We need to keep the amplitude, but at the same, but at the same time, we need to keep the phase. So, you know, quantum information is very easily lost. So before we lose quantum information, we need to complete calculation. And those kind of all these figure of merits come into play. And IBM came up with very intelligent, very useful figure of merit called quantum volume. So we're going to re use this as a quantum volume. This number, number quantum volume actually uh, shows out, represents the advancement of the, of the quantum computing, as I will show you in a moment, Charlie. I said quantum information can be, lo can be lost, very, lost very easily. I showed quantum uh, blob sphere to represent uh, quantum information. Sometimes we lose amplitude. So ampli amplitude zero becomes amplitude one. Sometimes we lose phase. We, the one that should be phased at that one point, point sometimes becomes the other direction by mistake. But the worst, worst loss of information is so-called decoherence. So quantum information is represented by a sphere. But as time goes on, sometimes we lose the sphereness of the quantum information. And at the end, it becomes just one line pointing either 0 or 1. Right-hand side, 0 or 1 is classical. Left hand side, complete sphere is fully quantum. Something in between is something between quantum and classical. We want to have fully quantum all the time. And you know, fully quantum, quantum computing is so-called fault tolerant uh, error corrected quantum computing. So the road ahead, this is the slide I retained from IBM. So I started off my talk from Moore's Law. Moore's Law started from number of transistors uh, in the first four sort of years of the transistor developments. And then, of course, this doubling of the number of transistors continue until, let's say, today. The other one is quantum version of uh, Moore's Law, shown right-hand side. In past three years, IBM has successfully advanced the quantum volume, doubling every year. And so this is, at least for now, called Gambetta's Law, after Jay Gambetta, who is responsible for leading the uh, IBM Q uh, research at IBM, uh, uh, at site, uh, in the lab. And we're hoping that this will continue so that the algorithm we develop will be useful, let's say, in seven or 10 years at a time. Based on this prediction, we develop our algorithm so that it will be useful, let's say, in 2030, as, I, as you will see. And today, IBM announced the achievement of quantum volume 32. So again, this Gambetta law is still going very strong, even this year. So there are many different kinds of quantum computers. At least from my point of view, true quantum computer is just one kind. It's called gate-space universal quantum computer being developed by IBM, Google, Rigetti, Intel, IONQ, Microsoft, etc. There are other kinds of quantum computer. It's a subset of what we do because um, basically quantum computer shown left gate Base is universal, so it can also perform the right-hand side 
so the, the Ising machine shown on the right hand side. Uh, the right hand side shows quantum annealer being developed by D Wave and NEC in Japan and so on. And more recently, Hitachi, Fujitsu, and Toshiba are using today's silicon chip to run quantum algorithm to show some speed up in calculation with respect to today's uh, normal silicon chip. Okay? But in reality, silicon chip, Moore's law is saturating. So even though today they show some speed up, from my point of view, real growth can only be achieved by true quantum devices. So this is why I'm very much interested. And this is why I'm, why I'm working on uh, IBM's uh, universal quantum computer. Just to show how different the uh, D-Wave machine or any quantum annealer is, I just want to give you how different the quantum annealing method is. Okay? In quantum annealer, they also prepare qubits. As I show here, here I show five by five qubits, so total of 25 qubits, prepared in a superposition of zero and one, sideways condition. And then what they do is they don't perform any gate operations to each qubit, but they introduce different interactions between neighboring qubits. So I show green, some resistive kind of things between neighboring qubits. That shows the strength of the interaction. Sometimes str strong interaction between two qubits mean two magnets see each magnetic field very strongly, whereas weak interaction shows very little magnetic field you know, seeing each other. Okay? And if they see magnetic field each other, if they are compass, they rotate themselves in a comfortable way so they configure in uh, some so-called so -called, um, uh, quasi, uh, quasi uh, um, stable conditions, right? Uh, low, it's not the lowest energy, so, but the sublevel. But once you're stuck at sublevel, I can go in and turn one of the compass, and suddenly all the other compass, seeing this, my turning of this compass in the middle, the other compass turn and reconfigure themselves so that they relax to different sort of, you know, um, metastable energy state. And the idea is to find the truly lowest energy states. And you can do this quantum mechanically by introducing tunneling from one state to the other by going through this barrier. Going through such barrier is possible quantum mechanically, but not classically. And going through this barrier only goes from higher energy states to lower energy states, well, basically it goes horizontally, so it doesn't go up, but it goes orient horizontally to go to cascadely going down to lower energy states. So this is the beauty of quantum mechanics. But as you can see, we're not performing any operation to individual qubit in this case. And programming uh, exists in the way we, we design how we design the uh, distribution of interaction between, between, between qubits. So that's just like, this, this is just like map on our navigator. We provide map and then we, the computer shows the shortest route from one place to another, okay? So what is, how do we use the quantum parallelism in quantum algorithm? I show 15 equals to three times five as, as an example, okay? There's a way that mathematician came up to do this factoring. Mathematician says, okay, the number you're trying to factor is 15. So just come up with any number you want. Smaller than 15, actually smaller than half of 15. So I here, I chose two, 
randomly. And then I just perform the protocol that mathematician tells me. Okay? I chose two, and mathematician tells me to do the 2 to the 0 divided by 15 and find the reminder. And reminder is 1. This is 2 to the 0 is 1, 1 divided by 15, reminder is 1. Then mathematician says, then do the 2 to the 1, 2 to the 2, 2 to the 3, 2 to the 4, 2 to the 5, and do the same. Just find reminders. And reminders turns out to be, turned out to be 1, 2, 4, 8, 1, 2, 4, 8. Here, we find periodicity, 4, in this sequence of the reminder. All I wanted to look for, all I was looking for was this uh, periodicity. Then once I see the periodicity, mathematician says, OK, now you know the periodicity. So just plug this periodicity R into this, these two equations. You know M. M is the number you randomly chosen, 2, two number 2. And then do this you know, calculation to find 5 and 3. OK? This was quick because I, by luck, chose 2, which leads to this periodicity, one, 4, in this kind of operation. If I choose 3, uh, it doesn't lead to this sort of periodicity in reminder. If I choose 5, it doesn't give, bring me anywhere. If I choose 11, that will lead to periodicity 2, and I will successfully find factoring factor 3 and 5. Um, so, you know, this is very probabilistic, and this is no longer, no faster than the other method known and, and known today. But if you do quantum mechanically, I can prepare 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, all these states all at once and do all these calculations in parallel, move from right to left, all in, all in one step only, and find this periodicity 4. I don't have to try out 0 first, uh, then move on to 1 and move on to 2. I can try 0 all the way to whatever all at once. So this is super parallel calculation. And you know that we just prepare zero and then do everything sideways to put zero and one on each qubit, which means zero, 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 all the way to one, one, one. And then use such state to go from two to the zero, two to the one, all the way to, to finding reminder in just one step. So now I have this results, but I have to read this. I have to read this out. Okay, I can only one combination of so many possibilities if I read out this point. I don't want to do that because I don't, I don't get this periodicity for. To do this, uh, I'm going to do one more step of quantum computing, so-called quantum factoring. So basically, somehow the figure is missing. So here, I, Imagine I'm showing the wave, 0, 1, 2, 4, 0, 1, 2, 4. So this wave with a periodicity 4. And wave with a periodicity 4, I can you know, Fourier transform to have just one peak at 4. OK? One peak at 4 means first bit 0, first bit 0, bit number 0 is 0. Bit number 1 is 0. Bit number 2 is 0. Bit number 3 is 0. Then suddenly, Bit number four is one, and bit number five and the rest is zero. So I can have so many bits, I can have only bit four, one, the rest zero at the end. And then if I read out each bit, I say it's zero, number one, zero, number one, number zero bit is zero, and the only number four bit is one, so that I know the period, I, 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 I know that periodicity must be four so that I can use today's computer to do the mathematical calculation to find out three and five as a result. So here I, I show the basics 
I mean, very, very fundamental aspect of this quantum computing. I need to converge the results to something that is readable so that among all the possible information, I can converge all this information into one s s bit so that I, will, I can find out the number I've been, I'm looking for, okay? So now I'm turned to development of quantum software application. There are so many software companies in the world. And we are not a company, but we are, we are collaborating, we are com competing against, we're collabor collaborating with and competing against such companies at KO University. So we had the IBM Q Network Hub at KO University shown at the left. We, perform, we, we, we develop algorithms and softwares, and then we send our softwares via cloud to one of the 15 IBM Q quantum computers in Watson Research Center and also Poughkeepsie in New York. And then we receive results back from IBM. Okay, from the hub, whatever we do, IBM will not see what we do. If you use IBM Experience, IBM will see what kind of operations you're performing, but by contract, IBM will not actually peek into what we do. But, of course, we work together with IBM in many algorithm developments, so, of course, IBM and, uh, and KO work together. We've been working with IBM Q in the past one and a half year. And we've been using, as I said, many quantum computers of IBM. And even if we use 20 qubit machines, we see differences in quantum volumes. So we start up from using an IBM Q Tokyo machine, and within two months or so, we see the emergency of the uh, emer emergence of IBM Q 20, same qubit, 20 qubit machine, but a better machine called Poughkeepsie. And again, in a month or two, we see emergence of even better computer called System 1. It's, ama it's been an amazing experience. We, s we, we can witness the ad advancement of quantum computing in real time. And now we have access to 53 qubit so-called Rochester devices. We, at the hub, uh, many researchers and students gather, but also we have engineers stationing full-time from two banks MUFG Mizuho and two chemical companies, JSR and Mits uh, Mitsubishi Chemicals. Okay? So we have, as shown here, six faculty members of KO, applied mathematicians, quantum theorists, um, biochemical engineers, and so on working with us. And then those are the postdocs. Second rows are the postdocs working with us, applied mathematicians, computer scientists, chemical engineers, and so on, Monte Carlo simulators, so on. Third rows are the engineers coming from companies, and fourth rows is the uh, IBMers working full-time at Keio University. So now I'm going to introduce our research. First one is the quantum finance teams, fast Monte Carlo. Uh, calculation. We came up with this idea of so-called amplitude estimation. Mizuho, KO, MUFG, two banks, and IBM, we all publish the same paper together. Two banks publishing the same together is a, so something unheard of, and at least in Japan, okay? And basically, this is what we did. The company came up with this, uh, uh, with this problem. Let's say Jap bank receive a million yen, that's too small, okay, uh, 100 million yen from the customer. And they have to transfer this money to, uh, to the US, transfer the yen to dollar in next 24 hours. And to do this, they do Monte Carlo simulation for five to at least 10 hours to find out at which point from now the yen is strongest against dollar. 
but you know they have to transfer money within 24 hours but they lose first five or ten hours doing this simulation okay they don't want to do this and so they wanted to join us to come up with faster way to for, to perform Monte Carlo simulation they also came up with this problem that they want to have as accurate as high accuracy as possible because today even though they their risk calculation shows that it is okay to put uh, 100 million dollars into this for a certain operation because of the error uh, associated with this Monte Carlo or other simulation that they use right now they only put in 50 million dollars instead of 100 million just to be on safe side but if they know that accuracy of the calculation is good then they can put in 100 million dollars so they want both speed and accuracy okay and to do this uh, we came up with this idea that before we came up with this idea in quantum calculation in, in a part of Monte Carlo we do the sequence show uh, pro, uh, software running. We start from one software operation and then move on to next operation and next operation and so on, which takes time. But we came up with this idea to divide such long operation uh, into many components that, are, that can be operated parallel. So we use classical computer to distribute the data appropriately and then do all these quantum calculation in parallel and then at the end we suck out all these data from quantum computers to put them together appropriately using, uh, using classical computer. So quantum computer doesn't work alone but collaborate with today's computer to speed up the Monte Carlo simulation. So this again shows you the sort of idea. Here's the one speed out from quantum computer. This is a second speed out. Actually, they came up in parallel, so they all came up at the same time. And then if they put out all these information together using classical computer, it, we actually get one spike, which is the result which, which we were looking for, which is like the results of the Monte Carlo simulation. Okay? So by doing so, we actually were able to speed up the calculation will actually minimize the calculation in 5% of the time, so it's a great speed up. But at the same time, we have been, in, we have been in, uh, improved the error. So red is a quantum model, and green is the uh, today's Monte Carlo, and the, right, the horizontal axis is the size of the calculation. For the big size calculation, we have smaller error for the quantum case. And we have been able to perform such cal calculation using real IBM Q devices. The green points are the results of uh, results we obtained by IBM experience, something that you all of you can access. And uh, cross points are the results we obtained from one of the 20 qubit machines. And the red curve is something that is the theoretical value that we're trying to obtain. So as you can see, we're not there yet with today's 20 qubit machine. Uh, actually, it's, this is not the best 20 qubit machines. We, we have better 20 qubit machines. But as, as you can see, our 20 qubit machine is better than five qubit machine available to public. Okay, so this is the meaning of you joining the hub or IBM Q network so you can access the useful IBM Q network machine. And this results were highly cited immediately by many groups. For example, QCWare is a startup company, and they adapted our, uh, our method. Also, very well-known uh, theoreticians called Scott Arison also referred to our paper uh, and also adapted our, our method. And our method was also adopted by J.P. Morgan Chase to start a new collaboration between IBM and J.P. Morgan Chase. So development of such speed up and also uh, improvement error, we think is going to be very helpful for the future of quantum finance and you know, FinTech in general.
we are also working on uh, working on basically breaking of the uh, RSA cryptography and we haven't succeeded yet we haven't even been able to perform 15 equals 3 times 5 so you feel very safe but you know soon we will be as a white hacker uh, performing such operation and then see by when you need to be very be, you need to be careful so here I show you as a function of the quantum volume here's the Gambetta law and by let's say 12, 2030 we think our algorithm will be useful and some of them will be better uh, than classical computing alone so that it will, be influ it will influence the business significantly. I guess I'm running out of time, so uh, I'm going to skip but, uh, some of the results I have. But uh, as I, because I promised you, I just have to show quantum chemi uh, chemical engineering part. Uh, we work on basically battery research. This is the uh, lithium dioxide air battery. This is the future of the battery. And we succeeded in modeling, exact modeling of the reaction associated with such batteries. So LiO2 goes from reactant to product. And again, th we have been able to model this with only two qubits and using the Hamiltonian. And then we have been able to obtain uh, initial states, transient state, and then uh, fi final product of, the, of such molecule using real IBM Q quantum computers. So we came up with the results uh, algorithm, and we came up with a software protocol that can be run by IBM Q, and we actually succeeded in such operations. So quantum computer is real, is in this sense real, and we are developing such algorithm. Lastly, very short AI. Um, again, there are this classification problem, uh, finding the difference, bet differentiating between panda and gorilla. Uh, this is called, uh, you know, uh, uh, support vector machine operation. And within this today's support vector machine operation, there is this inner product that takes long time with a classical computer. So IBM came up with this idea to replace only this part of calculation with the quantum computing, with this bracket notion. And this was the results of IBM alone in 2019. We extended this idea at Keio University together with IBM to actually make it runnable at IBM Q machine. So what we did is that, OK, only the kernel, only the inner product part is performed by quantum computer. The rest, the blue part, is all done by classical computer, um, NVIDIA GPUs, and so on. But we have come up with a better way of preparing the data for quantum computation so that we can run this with the quantum computing. And as a result, theoretically, we achieve such benchmark testing, uh, dividing, uh, drawing divisions between orange and blue points, 99% accuracy. And if we run this with a real IBM Q computer, this was a result half a year ago, with the accuracy of 88% with a real IBM Q quantum computer. And this is improving with the improvement of the quantum volume. So again, uh, AI using IBM Q is becoming real. And in the long run, we want to use such AI to develop new type of drugs and so on. So again, with the, uh, with the, uh, with the with expon exponential growth of IBM Q, we hope to be able to apply AI and chemical engineering useful uh, algorithm in 10 years or so. OK, so maybe I should actually skip this Google part. But Google part, this was great results. And Google and 
IBM, they have very different concept. Google came up with this idea of showing at least one problem that on Earth there that exists that can be outperformed by quantum computer compared with with respect to today's supercomputing. IBM, they're not in rush, but they're steadily building programmable quantum computer for us. So in 10 years or so, algorithm we are developing will be very useful. OK? So this is my last slide. We're having too much fun with quantum computing. And hopefully, you'll join us. Anyone working in academia and also national labs and so on are welcome to come to Keio University for a half a year, a year to work with us. Industry, of course, we're open for any proposal of collaboration. So thank you so much.